Hello, I'm Jeff Buck. I'm senior pastor here in Mount Auburn, and I'm here with a, a good man to my right. I'm John Wardinger, and I'm the director of discipleship here at Mount Auburn. And we're here back with our holy conversations as we look at the five functions of the church, and and as we really look at how do we be the church in these times. We've got to rethink the church, folks. It's times, if nothing else, demand it. Um, we have gone through now some pretty significant ones, John. Mm -hmm. We started with, let's see if we can do this. We started with, uh, the first one was shepherding. Mm -hmm. and the church, as the head of the church, Jesus shepherds his body, and we shepherd one another. Mm -hmm. Shepherding's the first. Then we went to teaching, how we, we got to teach the Word of God in a, in a world that does not know. That teaching is the process of equipping. You betcha. Then we have to proclaim. But we have something very specific to proclaim. We've got good news. Right. And this good news is built around the fact that we have a God who loves us so much that Jesus, his son, came for us and died on that cross for us. And the good news is that he took our sin upon that cross for us. And that good news should bubble up from within us. And the good news we're sharing is the overflow. Well, and we should be good news people. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a God who loves us. Everybody, ev not just us, we're not special. God loves every human being with that kind of love. We should be good news people. Mm -hmm. In a world of it, sometimes it feels like bad news, we should have good news. Now, I'm real excited about today. Now we're going to talk about the prophetic. But the key word that we're using here I know. is holy. I know. And, and, and so... Uh, there's a necessary linkage yeah. between what we're talking about in terms of holy and prophetic. Yeah. And um, yeah. Paul uses the word prophetic when he describes the functions, but we've chosen to use the word holy. But there's a problem. Yeah, and we got to talk about that right off because we want we're using terms that have. A lot of meanings. We want to make sure you're clear on what we mean, but we're, it was the best way we could communicate it. So let's, John, let's talk about what, what let's start with what um, holiness means, right? Right. I, I think uh, there, there's, um, this I think can be the place where so many churches go off the rail. This is what we are called to be, to be holy, but that holiness right. is not something we manufacture from within us. We can't, we are not holy in ourselves. I no. can't make myself holy. I can't buy holiness. I can't do more to make myself more holy. Holiness is right. the gift yeah. of God yeah. to us. It becomes, it becomes our identity only because holiness exists in God. Correct. If I have, if I'm holy, then it's because God has given it to me, made me holy. I'm like the prodigal son who comes home in rags, and the father wraps him in this beautiful robe. Mm -hmm. The father made the son, gave him his identity. Right. Gave him his status. In a sense, you're saying the same thing. God makes us holy. Not on, we're not holy in ourselves, but God makes us holy. He wraps us in that robe. So if I, any holiness I have comes as a gift from God. Now, the reason why this makes a difference, yeah. a very practical difference in the life of the church, is that when I understand holiness uh, as a church, holiness as an individual, comes to me as the gift of God, my response must be one of gratitude and humility because underneath that robe, I'm not holy, but the, one, <laughs> but the holy God is at work to claim me and to clean me up. Well, if we don't, then we start having some different attitude problems. Well, yeah, if, self righteousness, or if, if know, I think arrogance, if I think that uh, holiness is comes from me because I do this, that, or the other thing, right? Then, then that that you see it manif uh, manifests itself in self righteousness. It manifests itself in arrogance. 
And boy, does that push people away. Yeah. Didn't we see that with the Pharisees? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if I can't, oh, I'm holy, I can't touch you. Mm -hmm. I can't be with you because you might make me not be, you might dirty me. Mm -hmm. And we have that attitude in the church, folks. There are too many churches, John, and you know it too, that, oh, we can't be with that group or that group or that group. Oh, they might make us, and we're not, that might, we might not be as uh, holy if you they see, come You see, we got to go back to the archetype again. <laughs> right. And the archetype is Jesus. Yeah. And what does Jesus do in those settings? He sits down and eats and drinks with the sinners. And the Pharisees just kind of lose it. Well, their smoke comes out of their ears. There's these, I mean, they just can't understand. He eats with the unclean. Because his purpose is to give of himself, to give of his holiness to others, uh, to cleanse others. Uh, we're afraid. Uh, uh, it's the influence direction. Sure it is. Jesus is influencing others. He knows he will not be soiled by being with sinners. Because he we're... is holy and the source of our holiness. Right. And so when he comes into a situation, he brings his holiness into that situation. And that's really where the bridge is to right. prophetic. Right. And right. that's where we're trying to talk about this, because... Um, well, there's one other thing probably ought to be said. Okay. There is a demand for honesty here. Oh, big time. Okay, yeah, good point. Uh, I have to be honest about who I am. Oh, yeah. And I still know myself as, left to my own devices, I am a sinner. Absolutely. Holiness comes from the Lord. He is the only source of that holiness. Right. And um, when I start playing games or when I fake it, when I'm dishonest, um, all of that ignores the source. We get in trouble, John. And, uh, <laughs> well, of course. Well, we're two pastors. We've got robes. We look good. You know, when you... If we could put our stuff on, we get all dressed up, we look holy. You, you've you walked into rooms, I have walked into rooms where there's groups of people talking and all of a sudden the conversation all has to change because they know we're pastors. You know, you know, we, it's, it's funny. But I cannot be swayed by that and, and, and allow that uh, to uh, be a reflection of me. No. I and that's the to, danger. I, that's the clear danger. I have to point to the Lord. Because our holiness isn't from our robes. Right. Or our education. None or our nation. Or even by the fact we work at a church. If, we're, if there's any, if holiness is simply a gift to anybody who follows Jesus, he puts his robe on us. And mm -hmm. he makes us holy. Mm -hmm. And with that thought, I think that's a huge thing, because now we we talk about that. I think we ready to go to prophetic. I think. Yeah. And the problem is when we start talking about being prophetic, everybody goes, "Oh, you're talking about, oh, let's get the crystal ball out and, and let's let's look. What's the future going to tell? So the church is going to start talking about the future here. Yeah, and and yes, it is true that when we talk about the prophets. Uh, the prophets had that sense of telling what is going to happen, what the future would be like. But I think it's critically important to understand that that is a byproduct yes. uh, uh, of, of who the, the prophet is. At heart, the prophet is one who knows God, who talks with God, and more importantly, hears God right. speak to him. The, the prophet understands himself as a child of God. He identifies himself under the lordship of God. And so the prophet becomes the spokesman for God that they know personally. And they're proclaiming 
the nature and the character of God. So they bring God's word. They, God gives them his word. He brings their word to the people. Right. And it may be about the future. Well, it may be about right now. I mean, you got you have examples all the way through Scripture of both. But go ahead. Yeah. The, the one who holds the future is God. What He's got the last. He has not only the last word, the first word. You know, and it's all of that. But it's, it's. But even I think you've said something really important here. He he brings the very word of God into a situation. Right. And that changes everything. Because when God's brought into a situation, the living word brought into a situation, I mean, that that's huge. Um, but even before you get to, br- they bring the word of God into the situation. Right. It starts with the relationship yeah. they have with the holy God. Right. They know God and God's character. They know themselves. They know the people among whom they live. Um, frankly, it's not hard to be prophetic sometimes when you when you know God and know what God's about and you see people and see what they're about. Um, some things are pretty easy. They're pretty easy. To say. <laughs> God's not happy here, guys. Well, and I I think I think you're, this is important. I mean. The primary, really, the big issue, the primary issue here, though, comes back to this foundational issue of identity. Don't you think? Yeah. Because if the prophet does not know God, it's very difficult then to bring God's word into a situation. It ain't happening. Well, and if we know God and understand that this God I serve is holy, when I bring his word in, his holy word into a situation, I'm bringing his holiness into a situation. It's not me. I'm sort of a conduit. I, I, God uses me. I know who I am. But God is willing to speak to me into the situation. And it's really about the identity of, um, of knowing God and understanding that we're in a covenant relationship with him and that my relationship with this God is above everything everything I it, it, it's the one that shapes every decision it's higher than my politics it's higher than my marriage it's higher than even what you know even my church functions it, it's it's got to be that's my defining characteristic is my identity with my God right I mean right. that's where we're at and and so we're not talking about your character no we're talking about God's character no. that and that's what's brought into a situation mm-hmm. really right um, so when we say Jesus is the living Lord who is holy and worshipped as ruler over all, in a sense, that's the word we're really bringing in. That, yeah, that's the beginning place. Because as in all of these um, um, uh, functions, they all begin with Jesus. Because Jesus is the shepherd jesus is the teacher jesus yeah. is the proclaimer as well as the good news jesus is the prophet yes he is and jesus is the living lord and he right. is holy and uh might want to say something about uh the living lord yeah uh here at this point the reason that i can be in a relationship with christ is because of the resurrection. Amen. He is a living Lord. We have a living head. I mean, the head of the church is a living head. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a theology. It's not a nice idea. We actually claim that Jesus, a living Lord, is head of the church. So it's a real time relationship. Right. Well done. Uh, and yeah. so, so. Uh, uh, and it's, it's out of that that when we talk about uh, the character of Jesus, we're talking about he is holy. We know him as one who was without sin, the right. only one. And the, yeah, and he, and he carried our sin, which did not make him unholy. No. He was the sinless sacrifice on the cross. 
because he carried our sin, then the possibility now exists that we can be made holy when we accept what he's done for us and he gives us that free gift of holiness. And yeah, yeah, it's his holiness and his sacrifice that becomes effective for our cleansing. So, for the church then, John, the church is a holy people defined by the Lordship of Jesus Christ who live in a covenantal relationship expressed in worship and expressed in faithful living. That's a mouthful. Yeah, it really is. It really is. And, 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 <laughs> and, and yeah, I, I think that requires us to, uh, to break that down a little bit. Why don't you take just the first piece, the church is a holy, holy people. people. What does that mean? Well, that's our calling, isn't it? It's supposed to be. We're called to be a holy people. That You find that phrase all the way through from the very beginning. We're called to be a holy people. i got to take that seriously now. Well, yeah. That, that can't be just... Uh, that, that says something about my direction. Yes, it does. Well, it also talks about our heart. Mm -hmm. If holiness is not me... It's not what I do, but then it, it has to be reflected in my attitude, which means doesn't when when we're if the church is a is called to be a holy people, ultimately that means I have to yield myself. I have to bow before our holy God, right? I mean, that means I'm not in charge. It's not I'm it's I'm not ruler of my kingdom. God is. And if we don't have the right attitude, we'll never be a holy people. I mean, is that a fair beginning, I yeah. guess? It, it's not our accomplishment. Right. It's his accomplishment in us. And there's a, there's a difference in that attitude. There is. And we're in a covenant relationship with a holy God. Mm -hmm. And because we're in covenant with a holy God, that makes... Part of that covenant is me yielding to that God. And that covenant makes us a holy people. Because the, all, all the work is on his end. Because it's 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 because he makes us a holy covenant, a holy people in his holy covenant. I, I don't know that there's a straight out answer for this, but but one thing to think about is what's the can people tell that we as a church are grateful? Are we humble? Yeah. Are we grateful? Are we grateful to have a God who loves us that much? Mm -hmm. Do we treat each other that way? That each of us miraculously we have a God who loves us so much that brings us together and equips mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. See, that's that that's significant. And I, I, I and it, it, that should be expressed in a lot of ways. I mean because when we talk about being in a covenant relationship with a holy God, um I guess that's expressed in a lot of different ways, John. I mean we you've talked we talk about this here the church is a holy, a holy people, a holy people defined by the Lordship of Christ. We are defined by the Lord. You see, that, I think that's the key word. We're defined. Yeah. To define something is to label it or to give it identity. It, it gives expression to what the content is within that idea. Right. To define it. Right. And so... Uh, that's the same as identity. Sure it is. My identity as a Christian comes from the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and because it does, I am bound to my Lord, but I'm also bound to others in the body. Absolutely. Not only the body. The world. But outside of the body. It, it, within the body and the world. And what we're really, this, I understand this is deep. We're in deep stuff here, John, <laughs> I, and I know that, but we're trying to communicate something really important. We're bound to a holy God who makes us holy as a gift, but we're bound together as, as, as believers who are loved by a holy God who makes us holy. Now think about what that means. Mm -hmm. But we're also then, as we dare believe that God has given us this word to take to an unholy world as a word of hope. Mm -hmm. But let's let's talk about this a minute, a little bit, how this covenant relationship is expressed um, 
in life. One, it's expressed in worship, which is really what happens, not just individually, but corporately, as we fall before the Holy God, right? Well, worship comes out of a profound sense of gratitude. Sure. You know, worship doesn't come because God demands my worship. Uh, he does uh, ask for me to worship, but that's not the, the it's root It's not of it. a demand. There are other, frankly, religions or, you know, their gods demand worship. But you know, our God the, doesn't do that. That's not the root of it. No. I worship because I can do no other. Uh, but we worship in response to what it's a God. Re- it's a response to what God's done, right? I so mean, a gratitude response. Well, and particularly what Jesus did for us, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, don't we just we we worship in response to this God and what this God has done for mm-hmm. us, um, particularly Jesus. Well, but there's a second piece to it, though. I, I think it, we also worship out of a heartfelt need to hear, understand, and apply uh, the Word of God to our lives. Um, because I know holiness is not coming from, with me, from within me, I've got to stay in touch with the source. Sort of like plug it in. It's plugging Keeping it connected. In. It's ultimate internet. Yeah, but one thing we need to probably talk about, when we use the word worship, most people say, oh, I go to worship on Sunday at 9 or 10 or whatever. We're not talking about that, are we? I, I mean, Well, that's an expression of it, but it's much broader than well, that. It is. We're talking about, when we talk about this relationship as expressed in worship, it's daily. Mm-hmm. I, I should live my daily life in response to what God has done for me, which, which means I should live a life, frankly, do I show gratitude in my daily life? You know, do I, am I humble in my daily life because of what God has done for me? And that, that's daily. That, the great joy of life is when believers get together and celebrate this together. That's, right. that's big worship. But individually, that's, that's daily. Uh, there, there's kind of a, um, an inner forcing or inner, interconnecting kind of piece here. I can worship God uh, daily, uh, as an individual uh, kind of process, but if that is going to continue, uh, it, I, I have to gather with other believers right. to, uh, uh, on a regular basis, to reinforce that. Uh, we hold one another up and strengthen one another. We sharpen one another. In mm-hmm. fact, we're told over and over in Scripture the necessity of that for our own health. I mean, it, for our own strengthening, we have to do that. And See, I need to acknowledge not only does God speak to me, He also speaks to you. Right. And He speaks to every single person in the pew. And... Uh, we need to hear from each other, right? Um, you know, so I'm in charge of life groups, right? And, and that's our and small groups here. That's, that, that's our small group, and in one sense, that is also a worship setting, sure in which we hear back from each other. Because I need to hear what God is saying to you, as well as my sharing what God is saying to me. Because two things can happen out of that. Yeah. One is it can reinforce the message that I'm hearing uh, and give me encouragement. Secondly, God may be saying something to you that gives uh, a whole different uh, twist that helps me better understand what I wasn't getting clear. Well, you know, it's funny you should say that. I'm still amazed after, let's say, a lot of years of being in ministry, how surprised I can be by someone who gives me a point, they say all of a sudden I see something. They say something to me, and I see it in a whole different light. Mm-hmm. I've never seen that before. I've never heard that. You know, it is a living word. We have a living God who's who's actively living mm-hmm. in in us. And as we bring God's word into a situation, everything changes. You know, it, it, it this this relationship with a holy God 
isn't just in worship. It also is expressed in faithful living. Yes. The, and, and, and while we're worshiping, you might say that's kind of the the vertical part, but then there's the horizontal part. Mm-hmm. We daily live this stuff out. Right. And because we have a personal God, we know God personally, and we know his character, that should be expressed in us out. Well, if I know God's character and I'm grateful for what God is doing in my life, I'm going to want to emulate that. Uh, you know, I see that all the time uh, with the sports hero stuff right. and all kinds of, uh, of things where, where persons see uh, something that uh, another is demonstrating that they would be like, and they want to emulate that. Right. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about here. Right. And I, I think this is, I like what's said here. The prophetic church bears witness to God in how it lives out its life before the world. Now think about that. As we, as we practice this way, worshiping, and, and as we are standing before a holy God, that should affect how we live before other people. And, and last week we talked about that in terms of proclaiming right. and speaking out. From the prophetic, it's it's a little more of a sense of being. And, and maybe even doing. Would you buy that? I mean, it's, it's being present in the world. The doing comes out of the being. Agreed. It's the more I'm aware of God's justice, I want to bring his justice into the world. Mm-hmm. Is that a fair statement? Right. Yeah. The more... The more I, I look at a situation, and, I, and uh, this isn't how, this isn't right, because God says it's not right. That means when I come into the situation, I can't tolerate it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, right? I mean, I'm. I understand the hurt that. Yeah. That 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 direction is going to go. I I see the pain. Uh, I see because sin it always brings pain. And always brings destruction, right? And uh, and that's what's going to upset us when we see sin, is because we know where that road goes. <laughs> yeah. And even though we try to sugarcoat it, but we know where that road. What? Yeah. And, and and we know pain is down that road, and we want to uh, uh, call people back from that pain. You know, and that's been the history of the church. What I mean is, the church in the Middle Ages built hospitals next. To, you, you, if you had, a, if you built a cathedral, you had to build a hospital because the church realized you can't just preach it; you had to live it out. That's right. I mean, that was who we are. Every church did that. Um, it, if it, when um, you know, why aren't children employed? I mean, the church would would go and say that this doesn't. This isn't right. This isn't God's will for a small child to be working 12-hour days or, or uh, for um, all kinds of things. And, 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 you know, the church, this is, where, this is the function of Jesus where he comes into a situation and goes, you know, this isn't what God wants. Because what God wants is wholeness and joy and fullness in our lives. Yeah. He doesn't want brokenness and pain and sorrow in our lives. Uh, or selfishness. Or selfishness. I got to say, a lot of this is having to deal with selfishness and you know pride. I mean, he. That's where the church traditionally and through through our history, we've had to stand with those, the poor, the widows, the children. The, those that feel they're getting hurt, the church has often had to rise up and say, wait a minute, we, we can do this differently. And so well, what we're talking about holy, uh, let's, let's take that word just one step further. It means to make us whole. Yeah. yeah. The, the holy mm-hmm. is to make us whole sure. as individuals. And, uh, and that is a function of the church, to bring wholeness to people. Well, and what we're really doing in that, it's like the word shalom, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, 
you want it's it's being made right with God and right with each other. In a sense, we are bringing God's word to the world, right. not preaching it. It's where I go if I'm living it out. I'm I'm bringing that word with me and in me and through me, and that just spills into the world around me, right? Well, not just preaching it. I, I think we still got to preach it. Well, we got to <laughs> preach it and <laughs> but, teach it. But, but I'm trying to differ. I'm taking but, your point about we got to be it and then do it, it. Yes. and insist upon it. You know, and um, the church is not just a building. Well, I, that, that's a comment that I think has to right. to, to be added. Is um, yeah, we're not talking about a holy building. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're talking about holy people, and and we're not talking. You know, one of the problems that uh, the church has had historically is that uh, we identify the church with building, or worse yet, we identify the church with just the preachers uh, um, or the priests. Uh, no, one of the things of, of the Protestant Reformation was to remind us of the priesthood of all believers which is to say that we all share this common role and function of being a holy people. It's right. a holy people. And oh. also a prophetic people with that. I mean, we dare believe that God will speak to you in me. This holy God gives, gives his holy word, his living word to you and to me. And we take that word to the, to the world and to each other. I mean, that's really what we're talking. And when we bring that word into a situation, it, it changes that situation. At least, I mean, it brings God into the situation. Actually, I mean, literally, it's like Jesus walking into a situation and saying, hey, this isn't right. Or maybe, you know, this has got to be different or whatever it is. And, and that is a call for all all of us, the whole church. Uh, Jesus told Philip in the upper room, have you been with me so long, yet you do not know that anyone who has seen me has seen the Father? Right. Uh, that's John 14, 9. But I think that's precisely the model yep. that Jesus wants for every one of us. Have, <coughs> have you walked with... with uh, uh, a saintly grandmother, right, and not seeing the Father in her. Sure, and, and isn't that our daily prayer? We want to. We want people to see Jesus in me, not just me. I want people to see Jesus through me, in me. You know, we're hopefully we're more of a window than a mirror. You know, I, I, I want people to. I want to be a, a window that people can look through and see Jesus working. I don't want to be a mirror just reflecting back what they want to see. In fact, if if I'm a mirror or a picture, right, that's exactly what we don't want. No, and I don't want people to look at a building and say that's a nice church. Right. We want to, you know, literally, and this is where we use this a lot, we're the hands and feet of Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, we really are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, we are his body. As he speaks, he uses our hands and our feet and our every part of us to, to take his word to, both in the body and in the world. You know, that's an audacious claim. It is. It's a high bar to meet. But... That's exactly what the church is to be, yeah. is to be holy, mm -hmm. to be prophetic. We dare believe God's Scares word me. can be brought into a situation. Mm -hmm. And when we bring God's word into a situation, I mean, we're, that changes everything. Mm -hmm. I mean... Um, and he, that's why, of course, we believe in the role of the Holy Spirit in this, is that we believe it's not just me doing it. It's the Holy Spirit's revealing this truth, helping us to hear God's Word, helping us, equipping us to minister to each other, and particularly to how do we talk to others in the world. Right. Um, and maybe we should say just a second, how do we evaluate this? How If we say this is one of the five functions, being prophetic, 
being a holy people. How do we evaluate that? I think I think there's there's one question, one simple question to ask is God honored and glorified in us. Sure. Um, in in terms of uh, uh, the the Reformation, one of the five solos is to the glory of God alone. Right. Right. If, and that's the, the five solos, of course, are the ones that were used in the Reformation. Right. And that, that's how they define themselves in a very real right. way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, do we, as we look at a church, this church, any church, are we prophetic? Are, do we take seriously this call to be a holy people? Are we living out the relationship well, into the world? Here's another maybe way I've been thinking about this as well. I'm, do we reflect a holy God mm -hmm. or do I reflect an unholy culture? I mean, I've really been thinking about that for me because this is a harder one. I get it. And for me, because everything we've talked about, if we're holy, then I'm reflecting a holy God, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. It's not from in you. It's not me. It's God. If if you if 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 we truly, as I read my heroes, I love reading the autobiographies and biographies of those who've gone before us. Mm -hmm. I read Brother Lawrence. I read you know uh, Martin Luther. I read um, you know like um, oh Corey Ten Boom or, or Martin Luther King or Mother Teresa. All of them share this common humility. Mm -hmm. I don't care who they were. Mm -hmm. They knew their identity in Christ, mm -hmm. and that spread from them to the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the question, and they were, they stood on that no matter what they faced, mm -hmm. and sometimes horrific circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I have to, I was, I've, this, I was trying to think, how do we communicate this? And, and one thing kept back to me, as a church, who do we show the world? I mean, do I show the culture? Or do we show do we show a, a holy God that is truly high and lifted up, the God of God? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What which word are we we presenting to the world? Now I understand. I get marketing. I love all this, but ultimately it comes down to: Are we prophetic? Do we bring God's word to the to the world? I think one of the problems that we have today is the word holy has gotten a bad rap. Well, we've come holier than thou. And <laughs> that's a self-righteousness, that's a pointing at me that undercuts and is detrimental to the whole of the gospel. Yeah. Holy means I'm pointing to the Holy One, and it isn't me. It's the Father who has sent His Holy Son, right, to live and to die for us. And this holy God is alive, still working His word through us now, and He's our ultimate authority now. I mean, He He speaks through His word. He speaks to us now, and we dare claim that we've got to stand with with our God, no matter what we face. For it's the Holy One who can change us and the world with his holy word. Be prophetic. Be holy. That's one of the functions of the church. Amen.